All right. Good morning. Happy 8 a.m. to everybody. Yes. So last time we were together, we started talking about how species form. We finished talking about species concepts. Biological species concept, what were the other ones we talked about? The phylogenetic species concept, biology, biological species concept, phylogenetic species concept. There was one more. The last one, indeed. <laughs> Too bad nobody recognizes the third concept, <clears throat> the recognition species concept, which is asking, do organisms in nature or do independent human populations recognize the same units of organization in nature? We talked about how we define species. Those are just three examples of many. And now we're starting to look at what happens every time there's a split of a branch on a phylogenetic tree. What's actually going on in that population at that time that causes one species to split into two? That's the big question of speciation in evolution. So this is all a brief review from last class. So there are a number of ways that a single population or a single species can start to diverge. For a, population, for a species or a population to divide into one or more groups, two or more groups, and for each of those groups to start taking on new characteristics. So you can imagine you have a single population, and at some point in time, somehow, that population divides into two groups. We call those groups A and group B. So what we want to know is, what is that boundary. What is the condition, what's the force that breaks one species into multiple species, two or more? We discussed last time there are a couple of sort of classical examples that you've heard of before, like a mountain range divides a species, or a canyon or a river divides this, defines, divides the species, some sort of geographical barrier. That's the easiest sort of conceptual one to think about. So if there's an actual physical barrier, let's say there's a stream of lava between, say, a volcano erupts and it actually physically divides two terrestrial populations of the same species in half, then there could be unique, over long periods of time, there could be unique genetic changes, mutations, that occur in each of those populations independently. So you all the individuals in population A get the red mutation. And that changes them somehow, morphologically, behaviorally, developmentally, physiologically. And that in that southern population, population B, they get some different random mutation that makes them slightly different from the individuals in population A. So at one point in time, they were all the same species. But now they're starting to accumulate genetic differences. And if those genetic differences lead to reproductive isolation, as it says here down on the bottom, then those mutations could cause speciation. Populations A and B no longer can interbreed. If they're brought back together in nature, they have inviable or infertile hybrids. They're different species. And we'll go through this process a bit more in detail next class. I just wanted to introduce this concept. Of the search for the mechanism or the force that causes speciation is trying to understand how do you keep two populations separate either in time or in space or in some other manner, long enough for these mutations to accumulate separately in two species or in two populations. And then people like me, geneticists, try to figure out what are the genes that those mutations are in? What are the mutations? Why do they cause hybrids between populations A and B or species A and B to be infertile or inviable? So that's the big story of speciation genetics. And last time we came up with the short list of, this is the last review slide, this is the short list of what are the ways that you can imagine pre-zygotic, that is before fertilization happens, what causes individuals from populations A and B not to be able to reproduce and have offspring. So we've got physical, so we could have physical barriers. Geography, in other words. 
So any physical forces that keep individuals, males and females, from two different populations apart could cause prezygotic reproductive isolation. Anything that happens during or before the act of fertilization itself. So there could also be, we discussed, physical reproductive isolation, that is, the shape of genitalia or the size of genitalia. So genitalia morphology, which is a classic way, and there are more and more, and more stories of this happening in lots of species, where in two sister species, they can't physically reproduce because their genitalia shape has evolved so that they can't physically reproduce. So the morphology of genitalia. There can be temporal isolation. So if two species or populations are reproductively active at different times in the year, that's just a handful. There are more. But those are some key prezygotic reproductive isolation mechanisms. So if any mutations can cause these things, except for physical barriers, which doesn't have anything to do with genetics. But mutations can cause differences in genitalia shape. Mutations can cause temporal isolation sometimes, not always. So the prezygotic reproductive isolation incorporates ecology, some geography sometimes, earth sciences, and also genetics and evolution. Postzygotic reproductive isolation, we remembered from last time, was just focused on those two concepts. What causes hybrid inviability and hybrid infertility? And that's all about genetics, baby. So after fertilization, post-zygotic reproductive isolation, after the sperm and the egg have fused, anything that causes the hybrids, the offspring, to be dysfunctional at that point is purely to do with what genes were con contributed by the mom and what genes were contributed by the dad at fertilization and why, when they're combined together in one embryo, do those genes not work together properly. So after the formation of a hybrid embryo, that's purely genetics, if there's something wrong with that offspring, if it's inviable or it's infertile, if it's dead or if it's sterile doesn't complete development, and then if it can't have kids of its own, purely on mom and dad. Something wrong with their genes. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some examples, case studies of prezygotic reproductive isolation. So hopefully you'll have at least one story that you'll remember that underscores these types of prezygotic reproductive isolation. We'll talk about physical barriers next class. We'll talk about post-zygotic reproductive isolation starting next class as well. So today, basically, it's focusing on pre-zygotic reproductive isolation. What are things that keep two individuals from mating in the first place, from the sperm and the egg getting close enough together that they actually fertilize? So that's where we're headed today. Questions? Yeah. So when I wrote physical, I meant geographical. But yes, genitalia morphology is another physical barrier. It's just so the key distinction to make there is that the geographical, the first one, physical barriers, geographical barriers, don't have anything to do with genetics. And that has to do with earth sciences, whereas genitalia morphology presumably has a genetic basis. So you want to understand how geographical isolation versus genitalia morphology or isolation occurs, you have to study two different topics. I'll send you over to the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department to talk about the geographical barriers. Where would you categorize the uh, gametic incompatibility? So gametic incompatibility is, in terms of characterization, prezygotic. Because, and we'll go through an example of gametic incompatibility today, just briefly. 
but it's when the spermy egg can touch, but they don't fuse. So the sperm and the egg can physically approach each other, but fertilization doesn't happen. That's the issue. Right, so is that like a morphological issue thing, or what, what would you consider it to be? Because I know there's, you know, there's genitalia morphology, but... Well, it's a genetic issue. Yeah. So we'll talk more in detail about that. So I'm going to start first with prezygotic reproductive isolation. And for this, I have to switch to the laptop, which means these videos are not going to be recorded in the lecture notes that I record. But you'll, so you'll only get to see these videos once, and that's now. So pay attention. So just an example of what behavioral isolation looks like. It's hard to see a little bit, but these are two fish, two three-spine stickleback fish. This is a male, and this is a female. The male's in front, the female's behind. And these stickleback fish have been studied for a long time in animal behavior, mainly because one cool dude who actually got the Nobel Prize for studying animal behavior, one of the fathers of ecology. And what he spent most of his time doing is watching three-spine sticklebacks mate, which isn't a bad thing to do, I guess, if you're a biologist. Kind of I probably shouldn't cast my own opinions on this. And what he discovered was that three-spine stickleback males do the parental care in three-spine stickleback species. So what the males do is first they build a little nest down here on the bottom. This is being filled in an aquarium. So you add some sand, you add some leaves, and some grasses, and some other things in the bottom. The males will grab these things and make a little nest. It's like a little tunnel that's covered over with grasses or reeds or sticks or something. And what he'll try to do then is to get the female to follow him. He'll swim through the nest. And the goal is to have a female follow him and spawn her eggs in his nest. That's his goal. He's trying to mate. And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to get her attention. And he wants her to follow him down to the bottom of the tank to swim through his nest to spawn her eggs. And then he'll go back through and fertilize. And the way that the three-spine stickleback males, in one particular population of the three-spine sticklebacks, if you collect sticklebacks from the Sea of Japan, which is the one that's in between Japan and the mainland, the big body of water, these males have this display or this behavior called dorsal pricking. And what they do is they use spines. They're called three-spine sticklebacks because they have three spines on their back. Go figure. They use their dorsal spines that stick straight up off their back to poke the female underneath her chin to get her attention. Apparently, this is a turn-on for three-spine stickleback females. So this is what this behavior looks like. So the male's swimming down, and then he backs up, right? He swims backwards, and he pokes her <laughs> underneath the throat. And she backs up while he's doing this behavior. But notice, I'll play this again, that she doesn't turn away. So it doesn't seem, at least from a human perspective perhaps, like this is a negative experience. Right? She's following, but she doesn't, she keeps her body in line with his. She just backs up. And then they, keep, they start swimming forward again. So apparently this is how the male gets the female's attention in the Japan Sea population, one group of three-spine sticklebacks. So here's a different population of sticklebacks, one's down in the Pacific Ocean. So just around the corner on the other side, on the east side of Japan, or anywhere between the east side of Japan and the west coast, where we also have three spine sticklebacks. We have a male on the bottom here, and a gravid female who's ready to lay some eggs on the top. And he's going to try to get her to do exactly the same thing. He wants her to follow him through his nest. But the Pacific Ocean males, for some reason, which people are still trying to understand the genetic basis of, don't do that dorsal pricking behavior as strongly. They still do it, they just don't do it as fiercely as males from the Japan Sea population. So let's see what that looks like. So see if you can catch where he does a little bit of that behavior. So right there, he pokes her just a little bit underneath the chin, and that's it. So it's, yeah, it's, you blink and you missed it. So here it is again. So right there, he pokes her a little bit with his dorsal spine, and that's it. But again, the, the female doesn't swim away. She apparently doesn't find this offensive. 
Then now the question is, what happens when you take a Japan Sea male who does the intense dorsal pricking display, and you put him in a tank with a Pacific Ocean female who doesn't expect that sort of aggressive behavior? She's used to the gentler, kindler Pacific Ocean males. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> She's going to bite his head off. So here's the male, and there's the female. And let's see. Oh, she's, oh hell no. <laughs> I'm out of here. And I know that's a very short video clip, but the postdoctoral scientist at the time, June Katano, who took all these videos studying their behavior, recorded lots and lots and lots of these behaviors. And most of the time, a Pacific Ocean female would escape, is what this behavior is called, from a Japan Sea male that was trying to mate with her. But when you look at Japan Sea males and females together, individuals from the same population, their behaviors are compatible. And when you look between Pacific Ocean males and Pacific Ocean females, their behaviors are compatible. So it's only when you mix individuals from two different populations that they don't seem to prefer to, seem to, prefer to mate with each other. That's a form of prezygotic reproductive isolation. What this means is, even though these are all the same species, Japan Sea sticklebacks, Pacific Ocean sticklebacks, if you, you can in vitro fertilize these. Unfortunately, it's lethal for the guys. It's not lethal for the women, but we do have to sacrifice males to do these in vitro crosses. But you can take eggs from a female from either population and mix with sperm from a male from the other population. They make fine offspring, viable, fertile F1 hybrids. So in this case, maybe what we're watching here is the onset of speciation. And it's not for any other reason that there's a behavioral difference. There's a preference of females for males from a particular population. So in nature, you would never get this sort of interbreeding, because females from the Japan Sea population don't like the type of displays that Pacific Ocean males do, and vice versa. One example of prezygotic reproductive isolation, behavioral differences. Any questions about that? So we don't yet know what the genetic basis is. We don't know why there's a difference in preference. We just know that there is a difference in preference. I have a question. Yeah. So even though they're the same species, Ah, so the in vitro fertilization is only because we have to kill males to take out their testes and mince them up and then put them on embryos. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, just telling it like it is. So, right, so that process is only, it doesn't have anything to do with the speciation process. It's just that we don't have a way to, well, to be blunt, <laughs> you can do this in salmon. You can actually milk what they call milking salmon, which is to get males to release sperm without killing them. So there's a technique to do this in salmon. So salmon in vitro fertilization is a lot easier. In sticklebacks, the males are so small that we have to actually kill them. So. Can you imagine I used to do this for a living? OK. So here's the one brief example, then, of another type of prezygotic reproductive isolation. This is in your textbook, so I only touch on it briefly. You can read more detail about it there if you want. But it's this concept that there was one population long ago of Ragolitis palmonella, which is a type of fruit fly. It's not Drosophila melanogaster fruit fly. It's a fly that lives on fruit. And in the US, there are two different types of fruits that now these flies live on, hawthorns and apples. And this one species, apparently, had a mutation that let it also live on hawthorn trees. So it could eat the hawthorn fruit, reproduce inside the hawthorn fruit. And the difference, though, is that the apple tree fruits earlier than the hawthorn tree. And over time, maybe one population of these flies divided into a group that preferred hawthorns and a group that preferred apple trees. And you could imagine that this might occur because the group that prefers hawthorns has a mutation that helps them prefer 
to lay eggs in hawthorns, whereas the other population evolves some mutation that makes them prefer apple trees. So they live in the same space, these two populations. So you could have a hawthorn tree and an apple tree right next to each other. But when these two populations start reproducing on different fruits that occur at different times in the season, apples versus hawthorns, then those two populations can become reproductively isolated if they evolve to reproduce at different times in the year because of the fruit that they live on. So here the evolutionary pressure is the substrate that they use for reproduction, the fruits that they lay eggs in. Another form of what, what can cause two populations to become reproductively isolated, never mate with each other, that's prezygotic reproductive isolation. Other ways that you might not be able to mate with another population. Poor snails. So they can only mate with individuals that have shells that coil the same direction that they do, because otherwise they can't physically get their genitalia in the correct positions to reproduce. So you don't have any right-handed or dextral coiling snails mating with sinistral or left-handed coiling snails. Both of your snails, both of your shells have to be coiling in the same direction to get reproduction. So in snails, this is a classical example of that sort of physical reproductive isolation, not geographical, but something about the body. And it turns out, which is quite amazing to those of us especially that study the evolution of development, is how plastic or how frequently snails can change from either being right-handed coiling snails to left-handed coiling snails. And that's what this, this uh, phylogenetic tree from your textbook points out. So every time there's an arrowhead, there's been an evolutionary transition or a mutation that's caused an ancestral species whose shell coiled in one direction to switch chirality, or the direction of the shell. So it seems like it's rather easy for these snails to get random mutations that will change the chirality of the, sh of the shell, which means that in this case, you get that mutation that causes your shell to switch direction that causes speciation, because immediately, one change, you can no longer reproduce with your former close relatives of the same population that have shells that coil in the opposite direction. So it might even be that's why there are so many species of snails. Every time the coiling direction changes, you almost de facto get a new species. Oh, sorry, go ahead first, Francisco. So good question. Have they done pre, um, in vitro fertilization with these snails? I don't know. I don't even know. If, that would be kind of messy. I mean, all fertilization is messy, but that's a great question. I will look into it. So what would, so let's see. So you want to know, this is prezygotic. So despite the fact that they can't mate, if you look at, presumably, if you look at two closely related species, let's find, like for example here, Aeomoriensis and Quaisita are sister taxa that appear to have different chiralities. So you might, if you were interested in studying that question, you might pick those two species and see if, despite the fact that their shells coil the opposite direction, that they can't physically have sex, are they still interfertile regardless of the shell direction? That's a great question. Other questions? It doesn't quite make sense to me because when one snail decides to change chirality, like other snails change the chirality to match it, now they're off again. Right. So, or another way to put this is, or another concern is, if you're the one individual that gets a mutation that changes, causes your shell to change direction, who are you going to mate with? Brothers and sisters, usually. 
So you might imagine that a, one of the, that a parent gets a mutation that causes her offspring all to have opposite coiling shells. So then at least you've got brothers and sisters you could mate with. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! But this, so this is one of the main concerns about a lot of evo-devo, the evolution of development. How does developmental change occur when only one individual starts out with that mutation? So that's a great question. Fortunately, at least we can rely on the fact that we observe this occurring multiple times in snails to show that it does happen. We're just not sure of the details yet. How really, I mean, I suppose I have a lot of snails that live on my house. I should probably just go watch them. Yeah, maybe not. I have other, I have other reasons I'm interested in snails, but that's because worms tend to live on snails. Go ahead. So, the, so can I elaborate more on the evo-devo or the evolution of development concept? So evo-devo is a subdiscipline of evolution that studies how body plans of organisms change over time. And that's basically what this is. So this is a case of you have an ancestral population that has a particular body plan and what genetic changes cause that body plan to shift or change. And in this case, what I'm talking about, as I mentioned, was the direction of the shell coiling which isn't a major transition in development, but it does represent a developmental change. So something genetically is different about the snails whose shells coil one direction than the ones that coil the opposite. And what, for example, just briefly, one example of a question that you might ask if you were an evolutionary developmental biologist is every time you see this transition, so in every one of these arrowheads where there's been a change from left-handed to right-handed coiling or the other, might it, for example, always be mutations in the same gene? That is, is there only one way to make a, shell's, a shell coil the opposite direction? So every time you see this transition in evolution, is it always the same genetic basis? Is it always the same mutation, or at least a mutation in the same gene? Or are there lots of different genes that could be mutated, any of which could cause a snail's shell to coil in the opposite direction? It would not be safe to say it's in many genes but because it's so common, but that is usually the default assumption, that the more times you see an evolutionary transition in a sh small number of species or as rapidly as this, that yes, there must be many ways to make that transition. It's not always the case, but yes, that's a good starting place. And I don't know for this example if they know yet what the genes are that cause these transitions, what the mutations are. Other questions? Okay. So all ways to keep individuals from mating with each other. Oh, dear. Yes. Yeah, so now we start talking about genital, genital shape differences. And you know, it's really hard to find good pictures of insect genital shapes on Google. No, it's fabulous to look up, but you just have to make sure no one's paying attention to your search terms. <laughs> Fortunately, within the last year, this fabulous new paper came out that does actually provide me with some pictures of fruit fly genitalia to show you this morning. So, Drosophila fruit fly males don't really have penises. They're called something else. But for the sake of convenience, I'll call them a penis. Okay. So this is a micrograph of Drosophila male mating structures. And what I want you to focus on is not the penis so much as the ventral branches, VB. So you'll notice that right at the base of the penis, this ventral branch has a couple of little spikes there that point in the same direction as the penis, right? So like in humans, the penis inserts into the female Drosophila to transfer sperm. But look at the difference between different species. So in panel B here, we have a blow up of just the ventral branches. Right? So the, the AD, or penis, goes up in this direction from panel B. You just don't see it. So they're not as spiky here, right? 
Drosophila santomea has a very smooth, curved ventral branch, whereas a close relative, Drosophila yucuba, have these sort of spikes. And the hypothesis is that this causes some issues with reproduction when you mate Drosophila yucuba and Drosophila santomea together, because it turns out that the female reproductive structure, the vagina, in other words, although it's not called that in Drosophila either, in Drosophila yucuba has a shape that fits the shape of the ventral branches of the Drosophila yucuba males. And you don't really see that accommodation in Drosophila santomea females. Right? So there's a difference in shape here in the female reproductive tract that seems like it's co-evolved with the shape of the male genitalia. So what happens if you take a Drosophila yucuba male and mate him with a Drosophila santomea female? there's some damage that occurs because these ventral branches actually physically injure the female reproductive tract during mating. At least that's a hypothesis that's being tested. And so these sorts of differences can cause females, you might not be surprised to learn, not want to mate with males from other species when their genitalia don't physically fit well together, when there's female harm. So this is one way of getting prezygotic reproductive isolation. If, if two different individuals from two different species can't physically copulate, then of course you can't have any offspring. They're two different species. Bless you. Questions about this concept? And there are lots of examples of this. It's just hard to find pictures. But lots of mentions of this, at least in literature. Yeah? Uh, so then, I'm sorry, could you explain one more time the difference between this example and the snail example? OK, so in the snail example, right, so what's the difference between the snail example and this example? In the snail example, the male and the female can't actually get their genitalia in the same <coughs> location to even try to get insertion, I assume, in snails. I don't know exactly how snails mate. The difference here is that you could actually get the male to insert a penis or a drosophila penis inside the female, but that harms the female. So it's, this gets a little bit closer to reproduction, or to fertilization anyway, than the snail example, where they can't even get their genitalia in the same general area in proximity. Yeah. OK, so the bottom row is showing, so the question is, what's the difference between this row and this row, the prime? So there's B and there's B prime, there's C and there's C prime. What they're doing in these bottom rows is they've just added these black dots. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they were interested in understanding the genetics of the change in the structure of the ventral branches. So these black dots show landmarks that they use, so they measured the genitalia of many males, to describe the structure, the shape. And so they're just showing the five landmarks on every male that they used to look at the morphology, the shape of the genitalia. And they tried to do some genetic mapping to find the genes that are responsible for the changes in the shape. So that was the main point of this paper, which is relatively unimportant to us for the speciation purpose. Yeah. Um, when you say that it does female harm, my question is, there's like F1 hybrid and B2 progeny. Um, even though it does female harm, is it still possible they have viable offspring? Correct. So it, it is still possible that they have viable fertile offspring. The question is, does this reduce crossbreeding enough right. that it could eventually cause speciation? Okay. And I'll show the next and last example I have to show is maybe an even better, well, I'll let you decide if it's a better example of this same sort of phenomenon. Definitely, we talk about female harm in the next example, unfortunately. 
I don't remember in this case if it's actually mortality or if it's just preference not to mate with the males because it's painful. So they don't have to but it, manage your reproductive? Yes, absolutely. Correct. So the, the, the degree of difficulty that this provides a female who's tried to mate with a male from another species could vary. So it could just be she learns not to mate with those males anymore because it's harmful. It could damage the reproductive tract and prevent her from mating with other males of her own species or from different species, or it could lead to lethality. So it's the whole gamut. And there are examples with different insect species and other species of the evolution of genitalia shape that run the whole gamut. So there are cases where it's lethal to the female if she mates with the wrong males. There are cases where it just damages the reproductive tract. Does it damage it so much that she can't continue to reproduce? That's possible, oh, okay. yeah. So it is possible that it damages the reproductive tract enough that a female would no longer be able to reproduce. Certainly no longer be interested in reproducing. So I saved the best for last. My favorite topic, the Cineraptitis worms. And I just need to give you a brief background on sex and reproductive reproduction in worms. So as I've told you before, the species I work with, both C. elegans and C. briggsi, have hermaphrodite individuals instead of females. So here's a hermaphrodite individual up top. And she produces oocytes, eggs, and she also produces her own sperm. So the sperm in Cenorhabditis live, reside rather, in the spermatheca, the sperm room from Latin. And so the sperm hang out here. And these oocytes get born here at the end of the gonad, and they migrate down the ovary, and they become mature primary oocytes down here, these big, fat oocytes. And what the oocytes do is they just move down this tube, the gonad, and they run smack into this pool of sperm, the spermatheca, where all the sperm are located. So you can't help but self-fertilize if you're one of these individuals. So your oocytes just move right through this pool of sperm. And then after fertilization happens, those embryos now, fertilized eggs, embryos, accumulate in the uterus, and eventually they get laid through the vulva onto the substrate, wherever the worm's living. But it's not just hermaphrodites. There are males. And so the males can mate with, inseminate internally, hermaphrodites to produce cross offspring. And the way that the males do that is that they insert a spicule, which is a hard, not bone, but it's a hard object, maybe cuticle, that is pretty sharp looking under the microscope. I'll show you one someday if you want to come up to my lab and I can try to show this to you. Worm mating. But he inserts the spicule through the vulva into the uterus and then internally fertilizes the hermaphrodite. Then the sperm crawl into the spermatheca from the uterus and then they wait there with the hermaphrodite's own sperm and fertilize eggs as they come down the tube. The gonad. Okay. So hermaphrodites can self-fertilize. Males can internally fertilize hermaphrodites as well. So there is mating. That's the point. And because that spicule is kind of pointy, there can also be female harm in this case. So if you have a really aggressively mating male, he might damage the female somehow when he's trying to insert the spicule into the vulva. And this is because worms are kind of clumsy. They don't have eyes. They, don't, they can't see what they're doing. So what the male does is the male's tail has a different shape. The male's tail is basically like its hand. It's got a lot of sensory neurons in it. So the male rubs his tail along the body of the hermaphrodite until it senses a vulva. And then it just sort of tries to stick its spicule into the vulva until it succeeds. And then it inseminates the hermaphrodite. So it's, I would not want to be a hermaphrodite senorhabditis, if there are males around. Thanks. So this is a paper that I want to show you a movie from and a few figures from that was studying, again, just like the Drosophila case, what happens when you take individuals from different species and use males of one species to try to fertilize females for another species. So we're talking about two different species here. One is Cenorhabditis briggsi. That's a species that has hermaphrodite. So that's the hermaphrodite symbol, part male, part female. And then we've got a species 
C. nigoni, which has males and pure females. So there's a male female species, C. nigoni, and there's a male hermaphrodite species, C. briggsi. So based on this graph, we're looking at female or hermaphrodite, in this case hermaphrodite, percent alive over time. So what they've done is they've taken, in both cases, the same hermaphrodites from C. briggsi. They've mated them either with males from their own species. Right? That's the dotted line, C. briggsi crossed with C. briggsi males. Or there's C. briggsi crossed with males from a species that's a male-female species, C. nigoni males. Which cross would you rather be involved in? Neither. Percent <laughs> That's correct answer. Neither. <laughs> if you were a hermaphrodite, C. Briggsy individual, which male would you rather mate with? A C. Briggsy male or a C. Nagoni male? Briggsy. 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 Why? Longer. <laughs> yeah, because if so, for example, if you just arbitrarily take how long it takes for 50% of the hermaphrodites to die. If you mate with C. nigoni males, on average, hermaphrodites live a couple days less than if you mate with males from your own species. So this is the first experiment that was done that clued these scientists into that maybe there's something going on with reproductive isolation here. Maybe there's something that, when you mate individuals from two different species, it's harming the females. So they want to understand what's the genetic basis of this? Why is it that inter-between species crosses seems to have this effect on hermaphrodite lifespan? So presumably there's some harm, obviously, I think, right? Obviously. Somehow mating with males from a different species is causing you to have a shorter lifespan. So here I just want to focus your attention not on this whole thing. We're going to look at three different panels. So up here on top, panel A, what they've done is they've taken the males and they've stained their sperm with a fluorescent dye so that we can see where the sperm are after a male has inseminated a hermaphrodite. So all of that light punctate glow are the location of the sperm. And what they've drawn up here, this sort of partial circle in white is the location of the uterus. And that's where we know that the sperm should be. They're in the spermatheca, which are on the edges of the uterus, or they're around the fertilized embryos. So what they're trying to point out is that's where we expect to see sperm, just in the uterus and the spermatheca. And that's true for a cross between C. briggsi males and C. briggsi hermaphrodites. And when they do the same thing in panel B, and they look at where do you see all of the sperm, after fertilization of a male and a female, they're all right there inside the uterus where you'd expect them to be. Now look at panel F, where you've mated a C. briggsi hermaphrodite with a C. nigoni male. That was the bad one, right? The one that causes females to live less long down here. Where do you see sperm? all over the place, well put. The sperm are not behaving nicely. They're not orderly, they're not staying in the uterus, they're actually traveling up the reproductive tract away from beyond the spermatheca. Uterus, spermatheca, they're traveling up the gonad. That's what all of these white spots and arrowheads are up here, that's beyond the uterus. I'm going to skip this slide. Don't worry about this slide. It was just some control experiments that they were doing. They are important, but not immediately. I'm going to go back to one more video. And this might be really hard to see, so squint. There's an arrowhead here. And what they're doing is they're looking at one particular cell. So see if you can see this. That arrowhead's going to move along with the cell. We're watching one cell move over time. <coughs> really hard to see. But you can see it here, at least. It's made a depression in the cells of the hermaphrodite. So I'll play it one more time in case you want to try to spot this again. I know it's subtle. 
But what they discovered was that not only when you mate between the two different species, males of C. nagoni with hermaphrodites and C. briggsi, not only do you get sperm traveling up the reproductive tract, some sperm actually leave the reproductive tract and just wander around the body of the female, the hermaphrodite. So sperm escape the gonad, and that's presumably one of the things that actually causes the females not to live as long, is they've got rogue cells from other individuals moving around their body. And that's only something that happens when you mate two individuals from two different species, in this case. That's not true of every interspecies cross, I should have say. It's in this specific pair of species within this one genus, Cenoraptitis. So lastly, gametic incompatibility. I said we were going to get to this, I'll just touch on it briefly before we go. What happens during fertilization, which you will know when you take developmental biology from me, if you, well, I guess you won't now because you're all going to be graduating. <laughs> Congratulations, by the way. Is that there are proteins that are expressed on the outside of the sperm. So you could imagine that that's, if I blow this up a bit, there are proteins that are found on the outside of the sperm. And then you've got the oocyte, which is much, much bigger than the sperm, and they also have proteins on their surfaces that are basically receptor proteins. So this is a physical interaction between proteins that has to happen at fertilization in almost all species, humans included, where there has to be an interaction between proteins on the sperm and proteins on the egg. And only if those two proteins fit together do you actually get the process of sperm egg fusion fertilization. So if there's a mutation in a sperm that causes a change in the shape of that protein, say this is a sperm from a different species, what doesn't happen? You don't get proper sperm egg interaction, you don't get fusion, you don't get fertilization. That counts as pre-zygotic. This is as close as you can get to fertilization and not get fertilization. So it's pre-zygotic. The sperm and egg actually physically touch, and nothing happens. Like a fuse went pfft. No fertilization. So close. And so there's clearly a genetic basis for this. Mutations cause, right, genes encode proteins. Mutations cause differences in protein shape. So there's a clear genetic basis to these sorts of cases when we see them occur. I'm going to skip this next slide, which is also in your book, so you can look at it if you want another example of gametic incompatibility and how it's been studied. So in the last minute, quick update on our lyrics and a little bit of evolution rap. So I did actually just yesterday get the audio and the lyrics from Bubba. And here's the idea. So we've got some audio to record. We've got some video to record. If you're interested, I already did a Socratic poll from you about a month ago to ask who was interested in being involved more and who not. So what I'm proposing to do is the last 15 minutes or so of next class, if you're interested in being involved in the next steps, We'll just stay here and talk briefly about how to organize for the last couple of weeks of class, what we need to do. Okay. So next class, if you're not interested, you'll have about 15 extra minutes at the end of the class. So please be there if you're interested in participating. We'll do a little preview of the track, too.